morning. I think this is everyone, so we'll get started. Um, as we go in here, why don't you turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, and we'll look at verses 20 through 22. So I mentioned some of the prophets are called major prophets, and some are called minor. Remember that? And that has, again, to do with what basically the size of the book, not so much the content, and certainly not importance. I tell you that because Daniel is the last of the major prophets that we're going to consider when we start Hosea, and we'll begin the minor prophets next week. All right, let's look at verses 20 through 22 of Daniel chapter 2, if everybody is there. Still a few people turning, so I'll wait. <clears throat> if you guys don't go too fast, I'll make you hold your Bibles up here, and then I'll say go. And you guys will have to find it as fast as you can. All right, it says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. What a wonderful statement to begin this message with. This is really a psalm. It's a, it's a hymn of praise on the part of Daniel. He's recognizing God's wisdom and his might. Daniel knew that it is God alone that moves the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he raises up new rulers. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who will know understanding. He reveals the deep and secret things. The prophet extols God because he is sovereign. His kingship is the driving focus behind Daniel's worship. Who God is shaped Daniel's response to his revelation. And it must guide all of our impulses and our attitudes as well. Scripture asks of every one of us, What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? You know, I bet we all know folks that are very gifted and can make some amazing things. But I bet you've never said, Wow, this is a fine piece of work. May I see the saw that you used to cut this wood? May I give glory to the drill bit that made these holes? I'd really like to know who your hardware salesman is so I can thank him. Of course, it would be ridiculous to do this. It's the one who uses the tools that receives the glory, not the tool. And so it should be for believers who are used by God. Daniel gave God all the credit for the revelation that he had received about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. That's what he's responding to in this passage. But how often do people that God uses today receive some of the credit? Though we are just saws and hammers, in the hand of God, our gifts can sometimes become the focus. I don't know about you, but I require examples of men like Daniel. So often when God blesses my life, I'm tempted to take some of the credit for myself or completely forget to thank the Lord. Daniel didn't do this. He realized that without God, there could be no interpretation and no wisdom. In fact, Daniel knew there would be no kings or countries at all if God did not allow it. We need to value the challenge of this book. We need to apply the example given by Daniel. We must never fail to recognize the Lord for his greatness. True worship will always remind us of how capable and gracious our God really is. It reminds us that without him we can do and are nothing. Consider this quote. It will never do for the servant of God to honor himself. After his work is done, he must lay his head upon his death pillow saying, I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies. What am I, and what is my father's house, that thou hast brought me hitherto? I am, having done all, but an unprofitable servant. I have not even done so much as was my duty to have done. And that is the reality of our lives, isn't it? For all of the knowledge and wisdom and skill we might acquire, the meaningful answers will still come from God. Daniel knew this, but friends, I wonder how well you and I remember it. As we consider the book of Daniel... Let us allow this example to humble our hearts and draw us closer to the king. Now, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, the book of Daniel is named, obviously, after the man who wrote it. The Lord Jesus Christ personally identified him as the author, and the book itself also makes this claim. <clears throat> Daniel's name means, God is my judge. And he lived around the same time as Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Jeremiah, and Zephaniah. 
This is alluded to by Jeremiah in his book, and the prophet Ezekiel also mentioned him, describing Daniel as a man both righteous and wise. Hebrews mentions this prophet as well, saying the prophets who through faith stopped the mouths of lions. We know from previous studies that the long-term sin of the Jews and their refusal to repent had resulted in terrible judgments poured out on the nation by God. Other prophets, including Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, had already given the people ample warning. Judah failed to heed the word of the Lord, and so our story begins with a young man named Daniel being ripped away from his family. It was not uncommon for foreign invaders to kidnap young people from the countries that they conquered. They would often try to assimilate their prisoners into the culture, brainwashing them with pagan education and influences. This is what Babylon aimed to do with Daniel and the other young men that were seized during the first deportation. Chapter 1 and verse 4 tells us the Babylonians specifically sought out children in whom there was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. And their goal is also mentioned towards the end of the verse. It says that they might teach the learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. Attempts to get Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to eat the king's food is just one example of this. It's impressive to see that these young men stood strong and did not compromise in the face of very strong pagan influence, especially because they were young. They were likely only about 15 or 16 years old when they were taken from Judah. Daniel retained his orthodox view of God and his word in spite of all the enemy's efforts. This would later play itself out when he famously resisted the king's unrighteous decree regarding worship. Most of you should be familiar with that. Daniel endured an attempted execution by lions and was protected by God. Undoubtedly, all of Daniel's conviction came back to a genuine relationship with the Lord. The Bible says that he had an excellent spirit. This is referring to his God-given wisdom and his humble attitude. Daniel's faithfulness to God in the midst of a pagan society is an example to all of us. He exalted the Lord with his good character and faithful service, even while living under a very oppressive and wicked regime. Daniel tried to make the most of his exile. He held office as a public servant until at least 538 B.C., and he served in an, as an advisor of kings as well as a prophet in two different world empires. The record of his ministry spans an impressive 70 years, the entire duration of the Jewish captivity. Daniel lived to be at least 85 years old, and he likely wrote this book a little later in his life. During his captivity, Daniel received some of the most incredible revelations of prophecy ever recorded in the Bible. Daniel's word came to him, excuse me, God's word came to him concerning the histories of numerous world empires and nations. These prophecies function as an overview of God's program for Israel all the way from Daniel's day until the second coming of Christ. But they also accomplish much more. The book of Daniel is one of the fundamental keys to an understanding of New Testament prophecy. If you're going to understand New Testament prophecy, you're going to have to study Daniel. Passages like Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, and the whole book of Revelation are unlocked by the book of Daniel. Christ even referred to Daniel directly in his great prophecy of Matthew 24. Daniel's prophecies are also the key to understanding human history over the last 2,500 years. For example, Daniel chapter 2 teaches us that the Roman Empire is going to hold a central role in end-time events. In this prophecy, the empire is depicted with legs of iron, but it continues into the time of the Antichrist in the form of feet and toes made of part iron and part clay. The Roman Empire is what has united Europe, and it created the European culture that exists today. The Bible tells us that the Antichrist will rise out of Western Europe. He will be the prince of the people who destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. To Daniel, God revealed major events regarding the times of the Gentiles, during which Israel would be under the control of other nations. The times of the Gentiles date from the destruction of Jerusalem until the return of Christ to establish his kingdom. This revelation is expounded in six highly detailed prophecies found in Daniel chapters 2, 7, 8, 9, and 11 and 12. If you're taking notes, 2, 7, 8, 9, and 11 and 12. Daniel's prophecies are meant for the latter days and the time of the end. This means the prophecies are not intended primarily for Daniel's time or any other former time. 
This also means that the prophecies are not fully understood until the time of the end. Those that try to interpret scripture allegorically are very, very confused by the book of Daniel. If you study any amount of history and prophecy, you'll see many people have gone way off the rails with it. We don't have to be confused as long as we interpret the Bible properly. The prophecies are for our day and the future. To interpret Old Testament prophecy, we just need to understand that the church age and the institution of the church is a mystery that was not fully revealed in the Old Testament. During this present age, Israel is, as a nation is blind and God is calling people with the gospel and adding them to New Testament churches. When this objective is complete, Israel will be saved and all of her covenants will be fulfilled. The prophet Daniel was privileged to see future events on a very grand scale. All of his revelations culminate in the vision of a great conqueror, the Messiah, who will vanquish all other earthly kingdoms. This promised king will defeat Israel's foes and raise his exiled covenant people to blessing in a millennial kingdom, a literal millennial kingdom. Like other prophetic books, liberal theologians have often tried to cast doubt upon the validity of Daniel. This should come as no surprise. They claim that the book was not written during the Babylonian exile, exile by the historical Daniel, but in fact that it was written long afterward in the time of the Maccabees by an unknown person. And this view is really nothing more than a satanic attack upon the divine inspiration of scripture. The Bible's prophecies are ir irrefutable evidence of its divine origin. So the devil's tactic is to cast doubt on them with the lie that they were written after the events. These prophecies show that the book of Daniel is indeed of divine origin. The book before us is also unique in it that it is one of the few books in the Old Testament that was originally written in two different languages. The first is Aramaic, the common language of the ancient Near East, and the other tongue is Hebrew. Interestingly, the Aramaic po portions in Daniel deal with matters pertaining to all the citizens of Babylonian and Persian empires, while the Hebrew sections specifically describe Jewish concerns and God's future plans for Israel. Daniel probably wrote the Aramaic sections for the benefit of his Gentile neighbors, and the exiled Jews could read both languages, so they benefited from the entire book. The book of Daniel was written to encourage them. Many Israelites were confused, and they needed to be reminded of God's reason for disciplining his people. Hope could only come when they understood his character and purpose. God's greatness and sovereignty are on display in the, as the two primary themes of this book, his greatness and his sovereignty. In Daniel, he is revealed as the one who is in perfect control of all time and space. God had not suffered a defeat in allowing Israel's destruction. He was bringing all things to pass for the purpose of displaying the glory of his only begotten son. He would allow the Gentile empires of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome to all dominate Israel. And then his people would be scattered across the globe. Daniel's writing stresses God's involvement in the lives of men. Our personal stories unfold as a part of God's plan. Our perspective is so incredibly limited. We need to be reminded that earthly kings only wield their power for a very short time. Similarly, the Jews needed to know that God was still in control and had set an end to the time of their suffering. God's goals for human history include the deliverance of his people from oppression, the resurrection, judgment, and the establishment of his everlasting kingdom. If we're going to function in an increasingly hostile world, then we'd better look to the book of Daniel. When the prophet was threatened by those who sought his life, he could still look to the Lord with unshakable confidence. He knew full well that every part of his life was in God's hands, and he made application when he was thrust into the lion's den. He knew God would be able to take care of him. In contrast, the pagan king, realizing his gods were helpless, asked Daniel, Is thy God able to deliver thee? When the world begins to ask questions, when they see us in trials, and when men persecute us, we can still look to God for peace and for calm assurance. Daniel calls God's people of every age back to perseverance and hope. Like Daniel and his friends, today's believers are tempted to compromise the scriptures and worship what is not God. Daniel challenges Christians to live out their faith in a hostile and pagan world, whatever the cost. This challenge works itself out in several important applications that appear throughout this book. We need to apply the understanding that God is sovereign. We may know that mentally. We need to actually apply it. We must have an unshakable conviction that God is in control. The book of Daniel can strengthen this belief. However, we cannot just believe this fact intellectually. 
Knowing this, we must yield ourselves to him, as Daniel and his three friends did. If he is king, then we must submit to his will. His slightest wish must for us be a command. We must live according to God's revealed will. Next, if, as we fully submit to the Lord, we can start to understand what's going on in history. And Daniel reveals that he's guiding the course of evil to its final end, which is destruction. He also shows us that he's guiding the course of good to its ultimate victory. You know, some people are saying that the days in which we live are the most wonderful the world has ever seen. They believe that the world is getting better and better and utopia is just around the corner. They say that with just a few more changes, we can realize a world order that will surpass anything in the past. But this is just a satanic message of evolution. Other people claim that the world is getting worse and worse and that we're headed to, with just the push of a button away from extinction. It seems we're headed for a crisis. There will indeed be a final conflict between the forces of good and evil. Daniel tells us that such a crisis is coming quickly. It also tells us what the outcome of that conflict will be. God will intervene in human history to eliminate evil and establish good. Knowing this, how should we live right now? We should live exactly as Daniel and his three friends did. We should separate ourselves unto God and his will. We should be inspired to persevere by this book. Ultimately, a study of the book of Daniel should lead believers to worship God exactly the same way he did in the verse we read at the beginning by separating ourselves unto him. Let me give you some key chapters and verses for the book of Daniel. <clears throat> for a chapter, we're going to focus in on chapter 2. You guys can write that down. Chapter 2, because it contains Nebuchadnezzar's dream and its incredible interpretation. And that interpretation pertains to prophecies related to many different countries and nations of the world. Chapter 2. And then for verses, chapter 2 and verse 44. Chapter 2 and verse 44. And then in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. 244. And then chapter 7 and verse 14. 714. <clears throat> and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. The key word for the book of Daniel is kingdom. It's found a total of 57 times. And a key idea is preservation. When the nation of Israel came under judgment, all of the people suffered, whether they were righteous or evil. Daniel and his friends were captured just the same as their neighbors, but their hearts were full of faith in God. The early chapters of Daniel reveal the power of God to preserve the righteous, no matter their circumstances. Even when their nation was under judgment, Daniel and the other three Hebrew children were blessed by God and preserved, even from death. In the later chapters of Daniel, it can be seen that though they are under judgment, God still preserves the nation of Israel and will miraculously restore them. We've seen evidence of this in recent history when Israel was gathered from the ends of the world and given possession of the land in Palestine in 1948. God's preservation of the Jews will continue until the end of human history. Once again, he alone will be seen as their protector in a supernatural way. How is the Lord Jesus Christ seen in the book of Daniel? How can we see him there? You know, there's a verse in the Gospel of Matthew that has special reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. And speaking of him, it says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. The image of Christ as a tried and chosen cornerstone that will one day return to the earth in glory and judgment is picked up by many scriptures. We see the special picture in the book of Daniel as well. Chapter 2 and verse 45 says that the stone that the Babylonian king saw in his dream was none other than the Lord. It says, For so much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. This passage pertains to the future kingdom of the Lord and his rule over all nations. Verse 44 says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. It's our key verse. 
which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The stone cut out without hands is just one of several references to Christ found throughout Daniel. Later, the pagan king looked into his fiery furnace after ordering the execution of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those were the names he gave them, and exclaimed, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. He did not know the one that he spoke of, but this was no doubt a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. What an encouragement that he was right there with them. This vision is followed by the majestic scene contained in chapter 7. The Ancient of Days, God the Father, is seated upon his throne. The time is immediately before the return of Christ to establish his kingdom. And we read in verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him before him. Verse 14 is paralleled by the description of Christ found in Revelation 5. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. Moving ahead, Daniel 9 foretells the death of Messiah, the prince, when it predicts, and after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. What an important little phrase, but not for himself. Despite the necessity of this awful event, the assurance of ultimate triumph by our Lord runs through the prophecy of Daniel like a thread of gold. Indeed, he remains Lord of Lords and King of Kings. One final proof, even more significant than these all, is the testimony of our Lord himself. He quoted directly from this book when, as we've already seen, he applied the prophecy of Daniel about the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven as proof of his Messiahship and deity. He speaks expressly of Daniel the prophet by name, with the words added, Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Christ said, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Our Lord encourages all of us to study the book of Daniel, and also the book of Revelation. Both books are full of unfulfilled prophecy, and both can help us to understand the greatness and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ much better. This is our hope in trials, and it must be our humility in life. Turn to Daniel chapter 9. <coughs> Daniel chapter 9, we're going to look at verses, well, quite a few verses, 3 through 20. As we get some application from Daniel today. Now that this book has challenged us to submit to the kingship and rule of God in our personal lives, We'll conclude the message with Daniel chapter 9. I titled this, How Then Should We Pray? Daniel has given us a wonderful example of faithfulness and humility, and now he's going to provide us a very instructive account of God honoring prayer. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that the subject of prayer is a very important one to the Lord. After all, he chose to include more than 500 mentions of it in his word. We're given multitudes of examples of prayer throughout the scriptures because all of God's most useful servants were also praying people. I'm talking about folks like Enoch, Abraham, Hannah, David, Jeremiah, Daniel, of course, Nehemiah, Paul, and Lydia. The faithful prayers of God's saints often received significant results. Elijah's prayer, for example, stopped the rain in Israel for three years, and Moses' intercessory prayer for Israel would change the course of all human history. Coming into the New Testament, prayer was also a major emphasis of Christ's teaching during his personal ministry. The Apostle Paul mentioned prayer 25 times in his epistles. James tells us that effectual, fervent prayer availeth much, and both John and Jude exalted it as well. The Bible teaches us that prayer is actually one of the most critical parts of the Christian life. It is one of the most critical aspects of ministry. The Savior invites us to pray, he exhorts us to pray, and he commands us to pray. We can also see that a vibrant prayer ministry is to be one of the four foundational characteristics of a properly functioning New Testament church. There is a wonderful example of this highlighted in the first church at Jerusalem. Scripture tells us they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking bread and prayer. 1 Timothy 2, 1-2 supports this model by saying, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. 
As church members, we are, are instructed to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In times past, this biblical pattern was much more closely followed. In earlier days, America's pastors and even some political leaders made a habit of praying like this. And it is one of the reasons why God so greatly blessed our nation. At least 16 times, the Continental Congress proclaimed days of fasting, repentance, and prayer. And biographies tell us that the entire American community repaired to their various churches on such days. But this type of spiritual focus can only be led by the convictions of strong and faithful churches. One example of a praying church was the Metropolitan Tabernacle of London, England. It was a mighty church that relied heavily on the Lord in prayer. Thousands were saved with changed lives as evidence. The preaching was excellent and the church was very aggressive in evangelism, but the people testified that the real converting, life-changing power was during their times of prayer. Consider this quote about their work. Spurgeon regarded the prayer meeting as the most important meeting of the week. He often said that it was not surprising if churches did not prosper when they regarded the prayer meeting as of so little value that one evening in the week was made to suffice for a feeble combination of service and prayer meeting. How does this example stack up against what we're practicing here at True North Baptist Church or in our personal lives? Is there anything we need to change? In many churches, prayer is just not much of a priority anymore even the ones that claim to be conservative and Bible-believing. In spite of the emphasis on it all over the Bible, we're witnessing a severe lack of prayer across the entire world. There might be a lot of entertainment and business and activity going on, but there's not a lot of serious prayer taking place. After researching many churches in our country, a man named Thom Rainier made this statement in his book, Effective Evangelistic Churches. He said, I reviewed my consultation notes of dozens of churches I visited over the past few years. Most of them were in a slow decline, perhaps more than any single factor, the absence of dynamic corporate prayer ministries was the contrasting element. I could not find one declining church that had an ongoing prayer ministry specifically for the lost. Perhaps these dying churches have not because they ask not. So we know without a doubt we need to be praying as individuals and as a church. We need to pray fervently and even more than we do right now. But how should we pray? This is the question that prompted this little study in the book of Daniel. If we intend to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking bread and prayers, we need to know what kind of prayer will be both honoring to God and consistent with his will. And so I'd like to draw your attention to 10 characteristics of godly prayer. They can all be found in Daniel chapter 9. These will be fairly short points. First, let's read verses 3 through 20. It's a longer passage than normal, but I really want us to get the full picture. Daniel is speaking, and he says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces. As at this day, to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near, and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee, O Lord. To us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways, which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Yet all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey the voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil, for under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. And it is written in the law of Moses, All this evil is come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. 
And now, O Lord our God, thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and hast gotten thee renown, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from the city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy faith face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thy ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations, and the city which is called by thy name, for we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do, defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Daniel, the prophet greatly beloved by the Lord, is teaching us how to pray. This prayer is a lesson for individuals, for churches, and for nations. This is the type of prayer that precedes revival from spiritual decline. This prayer teaches the individual Christian how to confess his sins in accordance with 1 John 1.9. What can we see from his example? As we continue, write down these ten characteristics of God-honoring prayer. Number one, Daniel prayed by setting his face to the Lord. We see this in verse three. He set his face to the Lord. First thing we can see is that Daniel put his full attention to the Lord. This was no casual prayer that was prayed while he was distracted with other things. It was purposeful. It was focused. We are instructed to pray without ceasing, but there must be a time of to pray without distraction. In this situation, Daniel put aside other things to devote himself exclusively to the business of prayer. When he prayed, he went into his house and he got on his knees. We also need to set our faces to the Lord, just like Daniel. He prayed by setting his face to the Lord. Next, we can see that he prayed with fasting, also in verse 3. He prayed with fasting. Fasting is mentioned at least 31 times in the Bible. Daniel neglected ordinary food. Fasting is the act of humbling oneself and giving one's full attention to spiritual things. It is showing God that I am earnest about something. In this fast, Daniel was seeking wisdom and he was showing repentance. In the Bible, fasting is also mentioned in the context of seeking help and protection, of mourning, of facing temptation, of ordination, and of overcoming spiritual strongholds. He prayed with fasting. Next, we can see that he prayed with humility in verse 3. In verse 3, we see that Daniel was a humble man. Sackcloth was a coarse, rough, dark cloth made of goat's hair. It was worn to show, show mourning and repentance and humility. It signifies a contrite spirit. Ashes were put on the head and clothing for the same purpose. By wearing sackcloth and ashes, the individual put aside his own beauty and glory and pleasure. We too must humble ourselves when entering into prayer. Daniel prayed with humility. Next, Daniel prayed to God by name. He prayed to God by name. He prayed to God as Adonai. The primary meaning is master or Lord. It is to acknowledge God's sovereignty and kingship and creatorship. It corresponds to the New Testament Greek word for Lord, Kyrios. The fact that Kyrios is used 663 times for Jesus identifies him as Jehovah God of the Old Testament. In John 20, Thomas called Jesus, my Lord, Kyrios, and my God, Theos. This follows the theme of the book. Daniel also prayed to God as Jehovah. Jehovah is the personal name by which God is revealed in the Old Testament. In the King James Bible, Jehovah is usually translated Lord in all caps, and it appears more than 6,500 times. Jehovah is the self-existent, eternal, self-revealing, promise-keeping God. Daniel prayed to God first as the great and dreadful. He acknowledged him as the all-powerful sovereign of the universe. He is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, according to Deuteronomy. Elsewhere, Daniel described God's greatness as follows. His throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. It is no light matter to come before this God and Daniel teaches us the way. Finally, 
Daniel prayed to God who desires our love. God made man to love him. Mark 12, 30 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. God created Israel to love him, and the fact that Israel did not was painful to God. He likened Israel's love for idols and to adultery and whoredom. God says, They have fled from me, they have forgotten me. For man to love the creation instead of the creator, to love anything above the creator, to worship anything other than the one true and living God is spiritual adultery, and it hurts the heart of God as a wife's adultery hurts a husband or a husband's adultery hurts a wife. Next, we can see that Daniel prayed to my God. We see this in verse 4, 18, 19, and 20. It was very personal. His address was very personal. The sinner who comes to God for answered prayer must know God personally in redemption. Without this spiritual reality in place, prayer will avail nothing. He must be able to say with Paul, I know whom I have believed. Daniel could say with David, the Lord is my shepherd. Next, we see that he prayed with fervor all throughout, verses 3 through 20. This is an example of the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Everything about Daniel's prayer is fervent and passionate. The address of God is fervent. Eleven times he says, O Lord, or O God. The confession of sin is fervent. The petition for restoration is fervent. What passion is exhibited in the conclusion of the prayer? O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. He also prayed with confession, with fervor and with confession. We see this especially in verses 4 through 15. Don't miss the fact that the majority of Daniel's prayer is devoted to confessing sin. This is a fundamental aspect of biblical praying. Confession of sin is essential for attaining forgiveness, both for salvation and for daily fellowship. Confession of sin is no light matter, and Daniel teaches us about true confession. We see that there is no excuse-making, no self-justification, and no hedging. Daniel fully and unhesitatingly acknowledges Israel's sin and guilt, and he includes himself in the confession. He agrees with God about man's sin. This is the type of confession that brings forgiveness. This is true repentance. It is to acknowledge that I am the wicked sinner that God's word says that I am, and that I have absolutely no excuse for it. This is the type of prayer that a spiritually blinded Israel will pray in the tribulation that will bring God's forgiveness and restoration. Daniel emphasizes his confession by the multiplication and repetition of terms pertaining to sin. He says, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Sin means to miss the mark or to go astray. Iniquity means to be crooked, to pervert God's ways. Wickedly means to be wrong or to violate. Sin is all of this. It is to miss the mark and go astray of God's holy laws. It is to walk a crooked path instead of the path of righteousness. It is to violate God's law and rebel against God's authority. Daniel acknowledges that Israel has not obeyed the prophets. Daniel also admits that the judgment was the fulfillment of God's law and the confirmation of God's words. Daniel glorifies and he justifies God's word. He acknowledges the scripture is divinely inspired and established forever. God's words cannot be ignored. Every word of God is true and will be fulfilled, whether in salvation or in judgment. Men think that they can ignore God's word and live as they please without consequences, but it's impossible. Every knee will bow to God's authority and will acknowledge the truth of his word and will confess Jesus as Lord, either in this life in repentance and faith or in the next life in preparation for eternal judgment. What else did he pray? A couple more things. He prayed with intercession. <clears throat> he prayed with confession and he prayed with intercession. Verses 16 through 19. He didn't stop with just the confession of sin. He interceded with God on behalf of Israel. He sought mercy and help from God. He beseeched God. He didn't demand. He asked. He interceded on the basis of God's righteousness. God's righteousness means he's good. He's compassionate. He's faithful to keep his promises. He had promised that Israel would be restored after 70 years, and God was asking God to, Daniel was asking God to keep his word because he is righteous. He also interceded on the basis of the fact that Jerusalem is God's city. It's God's holy mountain meaning that he chose it and he set it apart from all cities on earth to be his special place. He interceded for the Lord's sake. He didn't intercede on the 
basis of Israel's goodness. He interceded solely on the basis of God's pleasure and glory. He asked God to look upon their desolations. Lastly, Daniel prayed with boldness. Verse 19, he concludes his prayer in a very bold manner, saying, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Daniel was not demanding something of God, but he was vigorously, passionately interceding. He was being bold because he was praying on the basis of God's own promises. This is what Hebrews 4.16 means. Therefore, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace. When the child of God prays on the basis of Christ's atonement and in the will of God, he can be perfectly bold. The prophet Daniel has given us a wonderful example of what it looks like to pray in God's will. And it's very encouraging to me that the Bible gives us specific instructions on the matter of prayer so that people can know exactly how to pray in a way that pleases God. We must set our face towards the Lord with fasting, humility, fervor, confession, intercession, and boldness. This is one emphasis that each of us can and should continue to grow and foster here at our church and in your families. We have to rely on the Lord, for without him, everything we're doing here will amount to nothing. Without setting our faces towards the Lord, we will truly be coming together for the worse. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank